Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Bassam Haddad, and I'm joined by uh, my partner and co-moderator in Partner in Crime and co-moderator, uh, Mariam Durani, whom I'll introduce in just a minute. This is the second installment of In Defense of Academic Freedom, Defamation, Intimidation, Suspension, which features Danny Shaw and Lisa Hoffman Curado, professors that are going to tell their story uh, today. And this event is organized by the DC, Maryland, and Virginia Faculty for Academic Freedom and Gaza and Context Collaborative Project. It is co-sponsored by MESA's Task Force on Civil and Human Rights, MESA's Committee on Academic Freedom, Faculty for Justice in Palestine, which comprises 115 chapters nationally. In the second installment, we host uh, two faculty members whom I just mentioned who have been suspended or fired for their support of Palestine during Israel's ongoing genocide in Gaza. They will tell their own story and address the context of, this, of their scholarship and advocacy, as well as how their academic freedom was violated. And we are here to tell them that they are not alone. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, Danny, Lisa, and uh, Mariam. Thank oh. you. Hello. All right. Um, I will Beautiful actually to be here. Sorry, I had to unmute. Beautiful to be here. Thank you so much for the uh, invite. Ahlan wa sahlan. You're um, a lot more than welcome, not just more than welcome. Um, we uh, will actually be uh, holding these events uh, in the near future, continuing to hold, continuing to hold these events because well, primarily uh, the um, intimidation and smear campaigns and whatnot are ongoing and they are being more and more systematic. But I do know that uh, the response is actually quite robust and this is why we are, we are here. I'll introduce Mariam who will then uh, take it over and then we'll have our speakers address the essential uh, part of their story and then we'll go into question and answer period. If you would like to ask a question on YouTube, please add the word question uh, ahead, but try to wait uh, for the second half hour to do so. Uh, Mariam Durani is a professional lecturer at the School of International Service and a faculty affiliate with the Anti-Racism Research and Policy Center at American University. As a decolonial feminist anthropologist, Dr. Durani's scholarship seeks to shift how academia, media, and public discourse reflect on and reckon with the racialized Muslim subjects in the and the impact of global wars on higher education in the U.S. and Pakistan. Mariam, the floor is yours, and Helen was Helen, and thank you for uh, co-moderating this series. Salam, Bassam. Hi, Danny and uh, Lisa. Nice to see everyone and to be here with everyone today. Um, so I have the honor to introduce Danny um, and uh, start us off uh, with today's conversation. So Professor Danny Shaw has been teaching Latin American and Caribbean studies, race, ethnicity, and class and gender at the City University of New York since 2007. He holds a master's in international affairs from the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. He is fluent in Spanish, Haitian Creole, Portuguese, Cape Verdean Criollo, and has a fair command of French, and works as an international affairs analyst for Telesur, RT, and other international news networks. He has worked and organized in 70 different countries, which is very, uh, impressive, opening his spirit to countless testimonies about the inhumanity of the international economic system. He is a Golden Gloves boxer, fighting twice in Madison Square Garden for the New York City Heavyweight Championship. He teaches boxing, yoga, and nutrition, and works as a sober coach. A senior research fellow at the Council on Hemispheric Affairs, he works to keep young people out of the military and prison industrial complex. He is a mentor to many guiding that to uh, he is a mentor to many guiding them through the nutritional, ideological, and industrial complex. He is a mentor to many. Um, sorry, he is the father of two young life warriors, Ernesto Dessalin and Kawa Amaru. He is the author of six books: 365 Days of Resistance, Shedding That Which Is Not Us, A Working Class Guide to Life, Foods, Training, and Healing, The Saints of Santo Domingo, Dominican Resistance in the Age of Neocolonialism. My son blazes within me, so many contradictions, so little time, uh, and so many more. He has also authored blogs and articles on Latin American history, boxing and nutrition, among other topics. And you can find him online at Prof. Danny Shaw. 
So with that, I would like to welcome uh, Danny to our conversation, and we are very honored to hear about the case uh, of what you're going through at John Jay right now, um, and we we're looking forward to learning more. Greetings, Miriam and Bassam. Thank you for this initiative. Thank you to CUNY for Palestine. Thank you to Lisa. Uh, thank you to Maura and, and, and Jairo, everyday anonymous working class heroes. Uh, there's so many of us who've been intimidated and doxxed and threatened and suspended and, and ultimately now uh, fired. And, and why is that? Because we dare to stand with the Palestinian people, uh, arguably one of the most forgotten uh, peoples, displaced. Before 1948, certainly, uh, there was encroaching uh, Zionist uh, designs uh, against uh, historic Palestine, but specifically in 1948. So 76 long years of humiliation, of colonialism, of, of white supremacy, of apartheid, of, of ethnic cleansing. And that's what really brings us all here uh, together. When I first heard uh, Miriam speak a week or two ago, uh, I remember Miriam saying, and this is the spirit of, of, of what Lisa shared as is, is well, how can we go on as normal how can we not feel this? Uh, to be quiet would be to dehumanize our, ourselves and shadow ban our very spirits, which was never an option. I first uh, learned about Palestine when I was a teenager. Uh, Bassam was sharing some of his uh, anecdotes about standing up for Palestine in the 1980s. And back then they would equate you with a, a, a terrorist. My activism really began in the 94, 95. I got my first kafias in Palestinian flags and from the jump palestine to me um was was the underdog uh, palestine was the haiti of the middle east palestine spoke to all uh, oppressed colonized occupied and humiliated human beings to stand for palestine was to stand up against uh bullying so when october october 7th uh, popped off i had a deep uh anti-colonial context and uh, like many scholars of the issue, I could see very uh, quickly, maybe in a matter of 48 hours, that now the Zionist project had its excuse, had its smoke and mirrors, had its uh, media opportunity in the Netanyahu's and these, these, these fascists were drooling, uh, uh, foaming at the mouth at the opportunity to completely uh, wipe out Gaza. I tried to use my uh, uh, social uh, media and, and any other means as an educator, as a professor, as a popular uh, educator to sound the uh, alarm. A um, mass movement broke out uh, across the world, an anti-colonial movement in solidarity with the Palestinian people. And um, I engaged in, in, in led different uh, conferences and workshops and speeches and demonstrations with um, Bronx Anti-War Network, uh, Within Our Lifetime, Palestinian Youth Movement, al Auda, all of these heroic existences, resistance, and all of these different uh, anti-imperialist organizations. And those are our true uh, anonymous uh, 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 heroes. Because if it's difficult for um, Lisa and I, if, if we can say that we've been through a, a lot, imagine our uh, Palestinian leaders, our Palestinian sisters and brothers who've had to go through two semesters now we're talking about six months uh, of, of a holocaust of human life i've felt censored in all the different spaces where i operate uh, in this society and to now just uh, cut to the chase uh, as a result um, i was uh, on october 20th i was doxxed and uh, anyone who's been doxxed out there uh, knows what it's uh, all about. Uh, they take over your email and your inboxes and your X and your Instagram, and uh, they call you a Nazi hundreds and thousands of times uh, a day, and they call you a skinhead, and they call you a Jew hater, and they call you a Jew killer, and it's, it's all of these uh, threats. They put out all of my personal uh, information, causing a lot of... Um, emotional harm certainly to uh, my family family members had to move out on october uh, 21st and concomitantly they took out my uh, twitter my ex uh, account my ex account at the same time was um 
delisted, deboosted, and and shadow banned. We're trying to fight to uh, keep keep that Twitter uh, active as it has been now for uh, for years for these anti-imperialist uh, causes, for justice, for peace. It's that simple. So doxed, censored, and what am I forgetting? Well, about two weeks ago. I, got, I was getting uh, all these phone calls over the weekend from the department chair of Latin American studies. And I was like, oh, this is going to yell at me again because of my Palestine activism. And it will be the usual you know, slaps on the wrist, if you uh, will. But in, in the legal realm, it's important to say that I never received any verbal or written communication or, or, or warning whatsoever. So this phone call on, on, a, on a Sunday, um, I was uh, fired. It was the president, uh, Carol Mason of John Jay College of Criminal Justice who intervened. It's the department chairs who always decide who's going to be uh, you know, reappointed, who's going to be hired. And that's what a department chair is for. There's dozens of department chairs uh, at John Jay College of Criminal Justice for the economics department and the anthropology department. And uh, uh, the president uh, intervened in the everyday autonomy and functioning of my department, and I was fired uh, after 18 years uh, as a professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice of Latin American and uh, Latinx Studies. So that's an intro to uh, my story. It what brings me together today with you uh, beautiful people who, in the very spirit of Palestine, we don't just think of ourselves. We, we think about um, our sisters and brothers in Gaza in the West Bank, the West Bank's under attack, and all of uh, historic occupied Palestine. Thank you, Danny. Uh, we have a lot to discuss, but I'd like to start with something um, uh, a bit um, Actually, let's should we let, let's hear from Lisa and then we do around questions. All right. Um, so I'll be uh, introducing uh, Lisa. Uh, let me uh, hold on a second. I think you're you're muted, Bassam. Let me introduce Lisa again. Uh, Lisa Hoffman Kuroda is a translator and educator born in Tokyo, raised in Texas. She received her BA from Wesleyan University and her PhD from UC Berkeley. She has taught as a visiting professor and as an adjunct faculty at Grinnell College, Bard College, and City University of New York. She is currently uh, working as an adjunct and translator in New York City. Uh, Lisa, the floor is yours, after which we will have a conversation all together. Sure, thank you so much, Bassam and Miriam, um, for having both of us here. Um, uh, it's an honor to be uh, fired <laughs> for speaking up in support of Palestine. I join um, along an illustrious legacy of, you know, other other scholars and intellectuals who have, you know, faced faced backlash for for doing the same. Um, so. Uh, you know, this is an attempt to silence us, to isolate us, to shame us, but I don't feel any of those things. You know, I feel really proud to stand um, in solidarity with people who, who have done the right thing, um, you know, including including Danny, including um, Jairo and Mora, who you had on your show before you, and going back before that, Stephen Salaita, and, and many, many, many others. Um, yeah, these are all people that I, that I really respect as well. Um, so, um yeah I, I will I will give a brief kind of uh, summary I guess of my story so um for context yeah I'm I'm a, I'm I'm Japanese Japanese American um, I was born in Japan and grew up mostly in the United States um, my PhD work was in Japanese Japanese literature um, and I I'm I don't have a long and a long illustrious TV, um, <laughs> as Danny does. Um, I haven't really published that much, but I've been, mostly been working as an adjunct faculty and as a visiting uh, scholar for the past few years. I I only graduated from my graduate work in 2018, um, so since then I've I've taught at various different campuses. Um, but in teaching about Japan and Japanese literature, 
Um, I bring a decolonial perspective to that work and I always have. Um, so not many know about this, but Japan has its own colonial and imperial legacies um, that have been covered over um, both by Japan and the United States. And I have always you know, put that at the center of my work um, because you know, Japan's imperial project uh, and colonialism in Asia has, you know, harmed, murdered um, Koreans, Chinese people, many other people in Asia. And so we live with those legacies. I live with those legacies. I have always felt a responsibility um, to teach about those colonial legacies. And if I don't, um, what's the point, right? So um, that's kind of where I'm, I'm coming from. So when I look at the context of Palestine, um, as Danny said, I see I see an anti-colonial struggle that is taking place, um, similar to the anti-colonial struggle that Koreans went through against the Japanese Empire and and many other people, right? Um, <clears throat> so um, you know, uh, I was aware of all this, and you know, similar to Danny, on October seventh, I was both um, hopeful, <laughs> you know, that they had you know broken through the prison wall, so to speak. And at the same time, I had a feeling of great dread. You know, I, I knew what was coming. Um, this, this was going to be an all out assault against Palestinians. I felt that Israel was probably not gonna stop until every Palestinian was dead. I mean, I knew that was, going, that was what was coming. Um, and so, yeah, I used the platforms that I had, the networks that I had to speak about it immediately. And um, as the images started coming out, um, I mean, they they were unbearable to watch, you know, um, and to stay silent in the face of that was an assault on my own humanity. I I couldn't stay silent, right? Um, I think many other people probably felt the same way. Um, so when we talk about um, what's been going on, um, I really want to center what's been happening to Palestinians because they're at the center of this. We know that the number of dead is much higher than thirty thousand. Um, because the mechanisms to track these deaths have been destroyed by Israel, um, by the bombings of Al Shifa Hospital, by the murder of journalists um, who were keeping track of the dead. Those mechanisms are gone, so we don't even know exactly how many are dead. We know it's definitely much, much higher than thirty thousand. Um, and as far as you know, our position, I think you know, universities and, and the media; um, these are all key sites where consent is manufactured for war, right? Um, universities, media, all these centers of, um, you know, civil life, they define the spectrum of acceptable speech and opinions, right? Um, and so the attacks on Danny and I um, are part of a much broader pattern of punishment toward anyone who dissents from that manufactured status quo, right? The, the status quo that is manufactured by our ruling class uh, they determine what is and is not acceptable to say, you know, in this moment. So, um, you know, Palestinian students um, and faculty too in the United States have always been at the forefront of this struggle to speak out about Israel's ongoing genocide of Palestinians long before October 7th. Um, but, you know, as we see, those who um, ally with them who are not Palestinians um, can also face face consequences for that speech. Um, but I want but I want to talk about, you know, the way that our targeting, um, our firing comes in a context, right? And that context is really important. Um, students in this country, you know, um, Palestinian students, but also their allies have been brutally beaten by the police. They've been harassed, they've been doxxed, they've been expelled, they've been evicted from their dorms, uh, left homeless. So we just saw at Columbia, they've been sprayed with chemical weapons <laughs> by members of the IDF, um, all for protesting in nonviolent ways, um, for what organizing teach-ins, organizing demonstrations, demanding that their universities divest from the weapons manufacturers that murder Palestinians, even just for having student groups like SJP, right? These have been shut down by the university on bogus charges, right? Um, they've been suspended. These groups have been suspended on multiple campuses, making it more and more difficult for them to organize. Um, SJPs are really, really 
important groups because these students graduate from the university and they go on to be uh, leaders in their community. They go on to be um, grassroots leaders, um, you know, many prominent members and leaders of wool within our lifetime and, um, you know, Palestinian youth movement came out of SJPs, right? So when the university shuts down and attacks these groups, um, you know, they're, they're looking at the long, the long term, you know, they're, they're trying to disrupt and, and shut down and make sure that um, these students cannot go on to organize. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to, to say all of that. And, and I also wanted to echo what, what Maura said um, in, in a previous iteration of this series, um, where she discusses, you know, the framework of academic freedom. Um, it doesn't, we have to start that conversation with the scholasticide and the genocide that's happening um, in Palestine, right? So scholasticide meaning the complete destruction of all Palestinian universities, the burning of their libraries, the murder of their intellectuals um, and their academics, right? From Hassan Kanafani to Rifat al-Arir, um, they target, they target intellectuals um, and even students, right, in Palestine who, who speak up, um, who use their knowledge and their perspective to um, draw attention to their cause. Um, students, Palestinian students in the West Bank, um, you know, have been targeted, have been kidnapped, have been put in prison, right? So um, we have to like frame everything starting from there. So in terms of, in terms of my story, um, I am very new to CUNY. Um, unlike um, Danny, I have not been there for 20 years. In fact, last semester was my first semester teaching at CUNY um, at Hunter College. Um, I was hired um, to teach a class on Japanese literature. The name of the department, uh, which I'll talk about more later, because I think it's important, the name of the department is the Department of Classical and Oriental Studies. Um, you can already see that this department has a colonial framing, right? The term Oriental uh, is an outdated and racist term to refer to Asian and Middle Eastern people. Said famously wrote a wrote a book about this term. Um, most universities have, you know, uh, replaced this term with with something like Asian or Asian American. Uh, the fact that Hunter College still even calls its department the Department of Oriental Studies shows you the colonial foundations of of this this department, right? Um, I will also add that um, the um, the head of the Japanese program is Israeli. <laughs> so um, I was actually uh, it, within the Japanese studies program, um, meaning, you know, people who teach about Japanese history, Japanese literature, theater, etc. Um, I was the only uh, adjunct uh, who's not white. <laughs> so you see there's already a colonial kind of framing set up there. Um, so I taught my class. Um, on Japanese literature. Of course, I teach it with a very decolonial perspective. It's mostly about um, the ways that Japanese literature has been tied up with the Japanese colonial project. Um, and October 7th happened and, um, you know, I, I, I sat with myself and, and thought about uh, my responsibilities here, uh, what, I should, what I should do. And I decided I shouldn't remain silent about it. So the only thing that I really did um, at Hunter College was I, I, about two weeks after October 7th, I, I opened a space for the students. Um, I just asked them how they were feeling about what was going on. And I let them speak about it um, for a few minutes before I went on with my class. And a lot of the students um, told me that they were really grateful that I did that because none of their other professors had even acknowledged that anything was going on. They had just continued with their classes as usual. Um, so, so a lot of them expressed gratitude to me that I had acknowledged it, I'd opened up a space for people to talk about it, etc. Um, <clears throat> that's not why I got fired though. Um, it was my social media that got me fired, um, similar to, you know, I think the other people that have, that have been on this series. Um, so I continue to use my Twitter and my Instagram, my social media um, to speak constantly about what was going on in Palestine. And I had a student, um, one student in particular, uh, yeah, I, I would say the majority of my, my students are probably pro-Palestine, but one student in particular tracked down my social media. Um, I don't share my social media with my students, but she found it. Um, she showed my, my pro-Palestine tweets um, to my, the head of my program, who is Israeli. 
I was not called into the, 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 the head of the program did not reach out to me or have any kind of conversation with me. Instead, the first that I heard of this was when I got an email from the Hunter College administration uh, telling me that I needed to come in for a meeting. So I could guess, <laughs> I could guess what I was being called in for. Um, but I know that I have some rights, even as an adjunct, um, and I would encourage other precariously employed academics to, to think about this, but um, I do have a union, um, the PSC, so I know that my rights um, as an employee, uh, if I am being called into a meeting that I have good reason to believe will result in any kind of discipline, um, I have the right to bring in a union representative with me. Um, so that's what I did. It's called your Weingarten rights. Um, so I did that. I was called into a meeting with the provost of Hunter College, the dean, um, as well as my department chair, who's different from the program head of the Japanese studies program. He's the head, he's the chair of the whole department. Um, so I was called into a meeting with these people and it was um, very brief actually. Uh, they didn't really discuss too much. Um, they said, you know, uh, we're not interested in punishing you. We're not interested in monitoring your social media. Um, this isn't, you know, we're, we're not, we're, this isn't going to result in any kind of punishment. We, we just have been alerted to um, some of your social media posts and we wanted to, to have a conversation with you about it because we just want to make sure that, you know, everyone feels safe. Um, and so the, the particular tweet that they had singled out was where I said, if you don't stand in solidarity with the Palestinian people, I do not want, want to associate with you personally or professionally. Um, that's a pretty hard line in the sand that I drew. I understand that. Um, you know, where I was coming with that was that, um, you know, I work as a translator as well as an adjunct and many, many organizations uh, that represent translators and writers, um, including PEN America, including the American Literary Translators so Association, all of these organizations had remained completely silent about Palestine, e even well into November. And so I was agitating and organizing with um, colleagues and friends of mine who are other translators. Um, and, and I was taking a stand, basically. I was drawing a line and I was like, you know, um, I know that I will face consequences, I, or I will lose professional relationships over this, but I'm willing to, you know, because I think it's important that we draw that line. Um, I am not going to work with people and, uh, you know, who condemn the Palestinians right now or who don't stand in support of them just to support or protect my own career. Um, and it was, to, you know, my, my thinking was to rally people um, to do the same, you know, to put principles ahead of their careers. Um, that's that was the intention behind that. But they were very, uh, you know, obviously that was that was the tweet that they picked out. I think they could have picked out a lot of other tweets, honestly. So in a way, it's kind of random which one they chose. Um, so they were like, you know, we just want we just want to talk with you about it. We just want to we just want to make sure that everyone feels safe. And I was like, okay, <laughs> that's fine. Um, you know, I have never harassed a student. I have never singled out a student. I have never, I have never said anything about Jewish students ever, 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 ever. Um, and in my classroom, I'm fair. You know, I'm fair and equal. Like I'm not, I'm not going to. I knew that some of my students were Jewish, but that didn't, you know, I didn't think anything of it. You know, I didn't single them out or target them, anything like that. Contrast this with someone like Shai Davidai, a professor at Columbia who has repeatedly threatened, singled out, physically menaced Palestinian students, called for their family members to be killed on social media. He still has his job, you know? So I have never done any of that. I have never threatened any student. I've never singled out any student. I have never created an unsafe atmosphere in my classroom. Um, in contrast, I created a safe space for people to openly talk about what was going on. And, and many students said that they appreciated that. So that's, that's the context. Um, so to my surprise, despite, you know, during this meeting, I was told 
They weren't going to punish me. They weren't going to pursue any kind of disciplinary action. To my surprise, a couple of weeks later, I received a letter saying I would not be reappointed for the spring semester. You know, it's it's difficult as an adjunct because we're hired per class. Uh, we're, we're, we don't work on a salary. We don't work on a salary or anything like this. So, you know, we don't really have any protections and we can be non reappointed for for any number of reasons. However, uh, the reason I know that this was deliberate is because weeks prior, I'd had a conversation with the head of the Japanese program where we had discussed specifically which classes I would be teaching in the spring. Two classes I was scheduled to teach at Hunter. So what happened? <laughs> um, the fact that this letter came two weeks after this meeting with the administration uh, signaled to be pretty clearly that I was retaliated against. So um, that's the context. That's the story. Um, you know, I'm basically resorting to community support to draw attention to this. Um, I don't have great hope that we will have justice through the university system or that we will get, I will get my job back. But what I do want is for people to know that it happened um, and for it to politicize people and to see, uh, to see what is going on and to connect it to all the other repression that is happening. Um, and to just, just to see how few rights we actually have, you know, um, that I can be fired for a single tweet that was singled out by a single student, you know, um, despite no complaints being made about my teaching, no complaints being made about my syllabus, nothing I did in the classroom, um, a single tweet where I urged people to stand in solidarity with Palestinians. That's it. So um, that's my story. <laughs> Glad to be here with you all um, to talk more. Thanks, Lisa, for yeah. sharing all this with us. Uh, all power to you and everyone here is in solidarity. Uh, we will uh, say more about this in just a few minutes. Let me ask, uh, let me go back to uh, Danny again and kind of zoom out a little bit and ask a broader question, Danny, about uh, the institutional setting. Um, why do you think, uh, or what do you think are the main reasons that universities in the United States especially are under attack? And, and how do you understand these attacks uh, historically, uh, sociopolitically and ideologically, especially in relation to your own work? And then we will get into some uh, specifics. <clears throat> yeah, well, every time I learn more of uh, Lisa's story, it's so infuriating. How can uh, conscious people not express their solidarity uh, with a young uh, professor who wasn't thinking of herself and her own family and her own interests. She was thinking about humanity and the most forgotten in the indigenous people of the Middle East. And um, what type of message does this send? Uh, they try to accuse us of uh, quote unquote conspiracy theories when we talk about Zionist control of uh, journalism, or of uh, the academic world, but we have so many different examples. And we have these uh, vitriolic Zionist professors, uh, one of the most states it publicly that he's there to dox and harass uh, the Muslim and Palestinian and Arab students. I mean, this, this is, these are hate crimes. Uh, this is Islamophobia. And they accuse us uh, all, all the time. They, one of the big attacks on the university and throughout society is the conflation, the ahistorical conflation of um, anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism, which is absolutely um, ridiculous. But that's how they've been able to ideologically, you know, control people. Um, I know Columbia University well. It's where I did my undergraduate and uh, graduate work. Um, I was assaulted in October of 2006 uh, at Columbia. It was front page news story uh, across this country, whether it was Bill O'Reilly on Fox or uh, Univision in Telemundo. Uh, the Minutemen, a racist, xenophobic, anti-immigrant group called the Minutemen had an event on Columbia's uh, campus calling for increased uh, violence against uh, immigrants. And um, when we moved to protest that event, uh, we were assaulted 
Uh, I was assaulted. My face was cut open and everything. And do you think any of those uh, assailants uh, were, were even interviewed uh, by the police or by Columbia Security? So we have these egregious double standards, which are very, very shameful in a country where they talk about the importance of freedom of speech and everyone has the right. And what they've done, too, is conflate uh, the violence against Muslims as, as well as the violence against Jewish people without really getting into the sociology and, and the concrete facts of how that plays out in our society. And imagine for these students at Columbia just to go to a protest, you now have to be afraid that these hateful Zionists can douse you uh, with, with, with chemical agents. And then there is uh, impunity for them. <clears throat> um, Going back to Said, you know, legendary Palestinian scholar, Professor Edward Said, my professor in 1996 uh, in undergrad at Columbia, and then tracing it through grad school, I had a, a student of Said, uh, Rashid Halidi, uh, one of the most uh, prominent Palestinian historians. So I was uh, schooled and mentored uh, by some of the, the fiercest anti uh, colonial minds, and that's why there can be no half-stepping, no, no, no vacillating in terms of uh, the importance of this historical moment. If if anyone's out there listening and you're on a campus, have you thanked the students for justice in Palestine? Have you stood in solidarity with Jewish Voice for Peace? Uh, any Chicano student organization, Puerto Rican student organization, the Haitians, and I mean, I, I remember undergrad, there's dozens and dozens of different groups. Um, do a joint event with your Palestinian sisters and brothers. Uh, do, do call for a joint protest with your anti-Zionist Jewish sisters and brothers, because it's not easy. It's not easy being on this side of the screen and, and putting yourself uh, uh, out there. Uh, I'm sure many of us didn't necessarily sign up for this, um, but if in some way we can use our own personal hardships to shed light on the war on Gaza, the war on Palestinian uh, nationhood, because it's not just the bombs, and this is something that so many of my social media posts until I was uh, completely, I'm still there on Twitter, but delisted, deboosted, shadow banned. In October, I could reach millions. You know, now I reach a hundred here and a thousand there. And then they talk about freedom of speech. I mean, it's such an absolute joke. The Zionists have long defined the campuses as one of the major areas of ideological struggle. So they have sought through uh, the Canary Mission, through these different fake organizations, the Anti-Defamation League. They have these high faluting, you know, very, very legal sounding and non uh sounding words. And, and these organizations are there to harass us, to plaster our faces everywhere. But for me, at, at 45 years of age, uh, not the first time that I've gone through these different anti-colonial struggles, uh, my scholarship, uh, I got back from the Haiti, uh, from the Palestine of the Caribbean. Of course, I'm talking about uh, Haiti. And it's very intense there as well when you speak up against U.S. and U.N. and OAS, the Organization of American States, and their pending fourth occupation and invasion of, of, of Haiti, which they've been trying to enact for the last um, two years. So uh, we hope that we can continue to uh, use our, 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 our voices. Um, some people have asked me uh, in, in campus life if I have any regrets. There'll always be, of course, you know, regrets. I, I, I wish I could have yelled louder. I wish I could have reached more people. I wish our movement was stronger. I wish our movement was more united. I mean, how many people have demonized our movement as a genocide happens, as, as a holocaust of human life happens, a dehydration campaign, a starvation campaign, the deliberate destruction of the medical system in Gaza, which was already faltering, which has already been blockaded. Uh, Gaza has been blockaded for how many years? And before that, it was occupied since 1967. So we want to continue to set up uh, different events where we can uh, educate people, use our uh, talents and, and expertise. And if Lisa said it back in October, I mean, now we're six months in. If it hurt us in October, imagine how people's quote unquote neutrality or silence 
or, or confusion pains us now. And I think one formulation, uh, we had a town hall meeting last night at, at John Jay. Uh, <laughs> that's a whole bullet point unto itself. Um, but one of the points we really hammered home, and I, I, I think this is arguably one of the best signs that I've seen at protests from the Bay Area to Times Square and everywhere in between. If you want to know what you would have done at the height of the enslavement of millions of African Americans, just look in the mirror and what are you doing right now? If you ever had a philosophical existential moment and you wondered from 1941 to 1945 when the Nazi death machine was marching across uh, Germany and into Poland and into Russia, uh, what would you have done? Would, would you have been a punk? Would you have been afraid? Would you have been intimidated? Uh, what you've done the past uh, six months is an indication exactly of some of the pressures you would have felt uh, in your, uh, with your family, uh, in your place of, uh, 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 of employment. So I think Palestine is the ultimate teacher. Uh, Palestine teaches us who, who's real, who's fake. Um, you know, in, in thinking of some of my colleagues, I'll save that for a little later, uh, because there's a whole lot of people, you know, who's, who's, who stood up for Lisa, who stood up for Heidel, who stood up for Mara, because these are brave uh, uh, individuals who stuck their uh, neck out. And just to continually come back, that this is not a religious issue. This is a human issue. This is a colonial issue. This is an imperial, an, an issue of empire. In Zionism, divides the historic Jewish soul, whether it divides it down the middle or not, that, that's, you know, I, I think different sociological studies, uh, particularly, I think Max Blumenthal's Goliath, Life and Loathing in Greater Israel, uh, takes us into Israeli society. And Israeli society um, and its institutions are based on the equation of the Palestinian uh, people with terrorism. And, and, and that is, so that, that's how we knew this was a genocide in motion as students of that uh, sociology, of that 76 year long years of, of, of dispossession, uh, we could very clearly see what was in, in motion way before October 7th, but October 7th was a clarion call for the world. Uh, but those uh, in, in power were able to decontextualize what happened on October 7th and keep going with their same uh, race pigeonholing, stigmatizing, and stereotyping, saying, you know, here, here in, in, in our country, like most people don't know one thing about Palestine. And guess what? In the 1800s, who do you think knew about the Lakota people and the Wampanoag people and the Navajo people and the Seminole people? So is it 1492 or is it 2024? I think that's a, a legitimate question we have to pose. Thank you, Danny. Uh, I have a question before we go back to um, Lisa. Uh, in your case, the college president, from what we understand, bypassed your department's leadership based on a coordinated pressure campaign led by Zionists um, regarding your social media. Can you tell us a little bit about how your case also demonstrates the systematic dismantling or breakdown of faculty governance across perhaps higher education more generally, uh, especially in um, public institutions like CUNY. Yeah, yeah. Um, for them to be monitoring um, my, my social media and there's these hate, hate groups out there and they monitor you know, every word uh, that one puts out, whether it's TikTok or x or, or or instagram or youtube i'm sure they're watching right now can we can we catch them if they use this word if they use oh they called us punks they called us colonial punks they are they're anti-semitic and they continue to try to obfuscate uh, the realities of, of what is uh before us so i remember those uh you know those days of organizing in october and in in november and there was a reality that uh, the nature of the censorship, if, if you were defending Palestine, you were in this lane. If you were more uh, liberal, you're, you, know, you were over here. If you were 100% Zionist, you, you, know, you were over here. And there was no way for us to even reach over there. 
that's how airtight the censorship is in 2024, um, United States and, and, and Israel. How many of my personal friends in the West Bank, uh, they're, 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 their homes have been raided at night, their legs and their arms have been broken just because they tried to use uh, Facebook or other social media uh, to, to, to critique um, the colonization and the occupation, the brutality that they go through uh, every day. <clears throat> so they did give us a, a sense to us that like, we were somehow all on our own in, in this in this echo chamber. That's a big part of the, the censorship, right? But as soon as they could find something that they could manipulate, they seized on that. They took whatever personal information, including my class times and this address and that address, and they put it out there. So I began to receive um, thousands and thousands of the threats. The most common threat was the most common threat was you know, hey Nazi, you can kiss your job goodbye. They basically shut down my John Jay um, College of Criminal Justice uh, email. Um, to this day, the security at John Jay hasn't taken any of the threats uh, uh, serious. I, they have not had my back uh, uh, in, in, in any type of, of way. Um, and when we've had our student and faculty and our whole movement with CUNY for Palestine and all the different organizations we've mentioned, People will follow us down the street and scream at us that we're Nazis and that we're terrorists and all we want to do is kill America. And I'm looking at looking back at these CNN and Fox News watchers like just just the level of colonial arrogance and um, bullying. So that's how a doxing uh, uh, plays out. Uh, lots of threats about a blood libel and um, all these people you know, whiter than me, more European descendant than, than, than me talking about, I'm indigenous, baby, you know, and I've been indigenous for 2000 years to the Middle East. And it well, it's mighty peculiar. You look like you're quite indigenous to Poland and St. Petersburg in the Pale of Settlement. And one should go back and read that history because one is in full, the same way I express this love for the, for the Palestinian people, historically, look at the history of the pogroms in the Holocaust. I mean, this stuff is horrific. Why would we wish this on any people? So, of course, that's why we have so many of our sisters and brothers who are Jewish, but they're they're absolutely not Zionists. They're proud anti-Zionists. So, the university, you know, all the dominant institutions of society. Our, our ideological battleground for these ideas. They have to fire us. They have to try to intimidate more because the truth is on the side of the oppressed, as Malcolm X taught us. And when you have the truth, when you're a man of God, a woman of God, and a man of conviction, and a woman of conviction, we, what do we have to be afraid of? They can spit on us as they have. You know, I've been spat upon by the Zionists how many uh, uh, times on, on Fifth Ave and in, 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 in June, you know, and if that's traumatizing for me to remember that, imagine for our uh, native Palestinian sisters and brothers. So we, we want to um, continue to build the, the solidarity. I don't want anyone to feel some of the isolation uh, that we, we, we've had to feel because that's what they want to do. They want to intimidate you, make you feel smaller, but we're not the ones who need to apologize. I've never laid my hands on, on well, with the boxing career, but we're not talking about boxing right now. <clears throat> I never laid my hands on uh, anybody. Uh, but, but this Zionist system does not recognize uh, Palestinian humanity or Palestinian dignity. And I think that's one of the main questions we have to continue to throw out there. Why, for you Zionists, why aren't Palestinians human? Well, how are they not native? It's their fault that they were in the land that you all invaded. Really, uh, the invasion was on steroids by 1948, thanks to the British, the waning British Empire and the burgeoning US Empire. Um, Danny, I know you have to uh, sign off for a couple of minutes to move uh, locations. Uh, before you leave and before we, uh, I give the floor to Mariam and Lisa, um, are you okay with us sharing the petition that, uh, that is circulating regarding your position. Are you both okay with it, Lisa and Danny? All right. It so, is your duty. It is your responsibility. <laughs> all right. So yes, that would be a huge. That'd be a huge help. Thank so you. 
it's it's up on screen right now and we will add the link to to the actual uh youtube feed for uh Jadalia where everybody's watching and actually more people interestingly are watching on hundreds of people are watching on uh x which was not our plan but this is, all of our those are our sisters and brothers across the u.s yeah. and the world anti-imperialist groups who are supporting us so keep keep sharing it and thank you everybody for tuning in whether you're on discord x etc it's all anti-imperialist unity all right so we'll 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 share this on uh uh on both youtube and x uh thank you danny please feel free to hop off whenever you feel like it and come back uh because there are a couple more questions and uh we'll i'll give the floor to um uh mariam and lisa Thank you so much. Um, it's a, such an important conversation and I'm really glad that we're all here together. Um, and I think this is a good moment to also now turn to the specificity of adjunct faculty who are dealing with the targeting. Um, so if you could tell us a little bit more about how how do we understand the increasing precarization of, uh, of faculty within the academic workforce and how that contributes to the erosions on academic freedom. And just as similar to you, you know, uh, for junior scholars like myself, when you're getting started and you start to be dealing with this targeting, it really, it, it's, it's, a, it's a confidence kind of like shattering moment sometimes of like, how do you kind of recognize the work that you've been doing and push back? And so if you could speak a little bit about the, the specificity of, of, that, um, of that kind of uh, position within the university and, and kind of how do we understand the, the ways that academic freedom is being uh, targeted for, for those of us who are, are dealing with that particular precarity? Yeah, thanks so much, Miriam. Um, well, as we've seen, um, tenure does not completely protect you. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm, I, I think a lot about Stephen Salaita these days. Um, went back and read his book after this happened to me. And, uh, you know, he, he's someone that, that allegedly did have that protection. Um, but as we saw, uh, you know, for him as a Palestinian scholar and how outspoken he was about everything going on in Palestine. I mean, this was this was years ago at this point. Um, the tenure was not enough, you know, to protect him. So, like in a certain way, um, tenure is a myth too. <laughs> it's a myth that's it's a sort of carrot that's dangled in front of everyone. Uh, that tells you, you know, just keep quiet, just lay low, don't take any risks until you get that magical tenure. And then you can say whatever you want. The problem is that by the time people get to that point, they've been so conditioned uh, to be fearful, to be obedient, you know, to not rock the boat, that even when they do have those protections, it doesn't matter, you know, because they've, because they've been so molded um, into, dis they've been so disciplined by the university um that you know again ev even if they're even if they their research deals with you know decolonial topics that's all well and good but you know oftentimes it doesn't translate that decolonial perspective doesn't translate to their actions to their words to their uh, willingness to speak out about colonial realities in the present so you know what's all that research good for <laughs> if you're not going to do that right um, but 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 adjuncts um, are even more precarious than that. We do, we don't have any semblance of protection, um, and increasingly we make up the majority of the academic workforce. And this is something that I would really like students to understand. Um, a lot of the people who are teaching undergraduate students in this country are graduate students or adjuncts or other precariously employed faculty, meaning maybe they're hired on a per course basis um, or a one, on a one-year contract or a two-year contract, right? With no guarantee of anything beyond that. Um, we're paid less and less and less. Adjuncts don't have health insurance. Um, we can be non-reappointed, uh, you know, a, a, as was the case with me. So they don't have to say that I was fired, that I just was conveniently not reappointed uh, you know, the following semester. I was fired, right? <laughs> um, but, you know, they, 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 they can get away with using this other language to, to do whatever they want. Um, so, 
in the face of that, I mean, and the reason that this is happening, the reason that uh, there are fewer and fewer tenure track positions, um, you know, and, and by tenure track, I mean, stable employment where you are paid um, a salary, you know, where you have health insurance, where you're on some kind of career track, you're supposed to get tenure, then protections. Um, the fact that those jobs keep vanishing and uh, being replaced by um, contingent or adjunct positions um, really, really is doing a disservice to the students um, when they're Did I freeze? When we're running from campus to campus um, multiple times a day to teach multiple classes, we're tired, we're frazzled, we don't even have time. We don't even have time or resources to do our own research. So, you know, I've never had a tenure track position since I graduated my PhD in 2018, which means I wasn't given any resources or time to do my research, right? So all that scholarship that I, you know, all, all the things that I learned in grad school, I, I never got the chance to take all of that and write a book, right? Or even write an article um, because the conditions of my work uh, were such that I, I I didn't have the time. I was I was just constantly teaching. Um, so so yeah, because because there's more and more of us like this, and we have even fewer protections um, than than tenure track faculty or tenured faculty, um, we can be gotten rid of um, for for any reason whatsoever. Um, it creates more and more of a chilling atmosphere, right? Because um, we uh, yeah we 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 can be let go of for any reason and replaced. Uh, we're replaceable. It's it's increasingly the university is operating on a gig economy. Right, um, where we one person can just be replaced with another. So um, that really does a disservice to students. That really does a disservice to scholarship, to knowledge, um, when we're treated like that. Um, unsurprisingly, though, adjuncts, despite all of this, have remained and are, I think, the most militant people in the university because we are the ones that are the most clear-eyed about its violences. We are the ones that experience that disposability, right? Um, we have no illusions about the nature of the university. And my time, you know, over the past few years working as an adjunct, working as a, you know, precariously employed faculty, basically from going from campus to campus, has really radicalized and politicized me, right? And I, I think that's probably true for a lot of people. So, um, you know, I, I, I think I think we need to we need to keep fighting. Um, and when things like this happen to us, we need to speak out about it. We need to fight back because it's not just my job that's on the line. You know, I, it's well and good to fire me, but the fact they did this to me means that they can continue to do this. It's setting a precedent, right? So, you know, when that line is drawn and we don't push back, it's going to keep eroding and eroding and eroding. And people think that their jobs are safe. They're like, oh, you know, if I don't say this or this on social media, I'll be fine. But the line keeps getting pushed farther and farther and farther. And pretty soon before you know it, they come for you too, right? So if you don't speak out now, you're gonna be next. So it's about pushing back against an entire system, you know, where this is, this is an attack on all of us, students, faculty, staff, graduate students, et cetera. Um, so yeah, that's so, I, I'm actually gonna just plug in my computer for a second, but thank you. For that <laughs> question. Yeah, I mean, I think um, one of the points that you raised is is about the disciplining that happens um, within the university. And obviously people, depending on their status within the university, are disciplined in different ways. And those of us who are in more precarious positions kind of are able to see that and, and not kind of be uh, oblivious to the way that, that that disciplining is, again, like constant every day. What you say during your uh, during faculty meetings, what you say within like, you know, uh, on the listserv, uh, when someone sends out an email, like those are all the moments where like you can start to see if somebody steps a little bit outside of the, the line that we're supposed to be in, immediately a response comes back over email that says that's not how we're going to talk about this or, or that gets reported, etc. Right. Um, so actually, like going along those lines and thinking about departments and the disciplining that happens, actually, both you and uh, Danny are actually not in 
uh, Middle Eastern Studies departments, and that's not your area of work. Um, actually, you're in, uh, you know, ethnic studies departments, and so, um, or area studies. I mean, and, and we can get into kind of how area studies and ethnic studies are are ripe for kind of a, a decolonial analysis. Um, but if you could speak a little bit about kind of uh, how do we understand the longer history of these disciplines um, of departments and how they grow and change and how, again, like the, the, the disciplining that's happening through these kinds of actions that kind of shapes um, what what kinds of scholarly topics are, um, you know, allowed uh, in many cases um, or not, as it were. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, you pointed to a really important schism that a lot of people don't know about. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about it. Um, ethnic studies, which, you know, comprises, um, you know, Latinx, Asian American, African American studies, all of these disciplines came out of student struggle, militant student struggle in the 60s and 70s, um, specifically around SFSU and UC Berkeley. Um, people fought to get those classes because they felt that their histories were not being represented in the course curriculum, right? This is also a demand that the Black Panthers had that we want, you know, we want Black Studies courses, right? So um, that came out of, yeah, a real militant politic. Um, it got watered down over the years, for sure, um, as it got sort of incorporated into the neoliberal university, but that came out of a certain kind of student struggle. Area studies, and by that I mean fields or disciplines that take a region of the world as their object of study, so that's Asian studies, Latin American studies, etc. These were Cold War formations, so these were disciplines that the U.S. government was very interested in founding in universities because they wanted to develop researchers and scholars that would be experts on these places in the world that the U.S. had a vested interest in during the Cold War. So that was the opposite of anti-colonial. <laughs> it was very colonial. It was very intentionally colonial. Um, so to this day, um, these fields have yet to really reckon with that. Um, and you can see that reflected in a lot of different ways. So Asian studies, Japanese studies, which is kind of a subset of it. Um, one of the ways that that's reflected, that colonial history is reflected, is that it's overwhelmingly majority white scholars who are teaching about Asia. And that's very intentional because that's how it was set up, right? Um, I, 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 I don't know if that's as true for Latin American studies, but it's certainly true for, for Asian studies. So for me, as a young person in my early 20s, coming in just wanting to study my own history, um, I was in for a bit of a shock, <laughs> you know, because I, I was like, okay, I'm, I'm here for a little bit of a different reason. My, depart my department was very white, you know, most of my professors were white. So I was already reckoning with this in grad school and trying to come to terms with this contradiction. Um, there are, of course, um, scholars within these fields that push back against this framework, that criticize this framework. But um, because the field has this colonial framing and because the scholars are overwhelmingly white, um, scholars of color are really marginalized within these fields that are supposed to be, I mean, I'm from Japan, you know, this is my history, but I was not given a tenure track position. You know, I watched as many, many of the graduate students in my department, most of whom were white men, I watched them all get tenure track jobs teaching about Japan and Japanese, right? While I didn't, you know, um, despite that I had the same qualifications, all these things, you know, I was, I was only able to get these kind of um, adjunct jobs. Right, and there's a real racial split there. Um, that's 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 reflective of that colonial framework of the discipline. So that brings me to Hunter College, because when I was hired there, of note is that the program head of the Japanese Studies Department was Israeli. Right. So why does why, why is an Israeli woman in charge of Japanese studies? Why, why are all the other people teaching about Japan white? 
Um, and when I, who, you know, I'm, I'm from Japan and I'm actually trying to teach students a history and perspective on Japan that is decolonial, that goes against their kind of apolitical rosy vision of Japan, <laughs> um, that I'm trying to teach the real history that happened there, um, which is Japan's own colonial past. Um, and of course, implied in that is my tendency to speak out about current colonial struggles, um, I'm pushed out, right? Because I don't fit that framing. I don't belong in that department because the whole premise of it is to look at Asia as this just kind of depoliticized, beautiful culture that that, that is sort of divorced from real, real kind of like colonial like history, right? Um, and God forbid we we connect that history to what's the colonial ongoing colonial legacies of the United States where we are, right? Um, so so yeah, I, th I think it's really important to think about that. Um, and you know, if there are other Japanese Americans or Asian Americans here, like I would like us to think about that um, and like what is our relationship to the Palestinian struggle um, as Asian Americans? Like we need to reckon with our well, in my case, I need to reckon with Japan's own colonial past, right? But we need to make these connections. Um, we we need to not do the Cold War thing of separating uh, all these different parts of the world into containers, these contained sites of you know isolated pockets of knowledge. Um, we need to actually connect them. So when you do that, though, that's that's what's what's th threatening to people, right? Um, so anyway, I think that's all I'll say for that. Thank you so much for, for for explaining kind of again like the the uh, important construction of area studies and ethnic studies and especially the history of area studies as a, a imperial technology meant to uh, isolate um, regional uh, you know scholarship in a way that, that the connections are not seen. And so right now, I mean, so much of the work that we're doing as professors is helping our students make the connections between what's happening in the US, what's happening in Gaza, what's happening in Palestine, and so many other parts of the world, of course, we're all connected in so many ways when it comes to this. Um, yeah. Um, do you want me to go, Mariam? Okay. Sounds uh, Danny, uh, <clears throat> very nice background. I love the orange. Uh, there's an orange chair behind you. It's very nice. So uh, not as fancy as yours. Sorry, I'm not as fancy as yours. Well, you know, I'm doing. I'm. We're doing all of this stuff. We have to have it. <laughs> um, so let me ask you about your colleagues and the extent to which you've received any support from your uh, colleagues, and uh, how should we understand often. Uh, the silence. I mean, we kind of figure out why there's silence. I mean, it's a very divi divisive issue. And uh, in my mind, as I've shared with you a little bit before uh, we started, uh, you know, I'm, I'm outing myself here, but, you know, from the mid 80s, I mean, it's just that, uh, quote unquote, supporters of Israel are extremely, uh, like, first of all, why are they scared, right? Because it's those of us who are critiquing Israel's violation of human rights, international law, and so on, that should be scared because we're the ones under the gun when we do the same thing that everyone else does regarding every other country that does this. So going back to the question, what kind of support have you gotten or not gotten from your colleagues and why? Mm, yeah, that's a pivotal question. In some ways, my reality is the diametrical uh, inverse, the diametrical opposite of uh, what, what Lisa lays out. So I'm at a pretty, you know, I'd say a prestigious um, Latin American and Latinx studies uh, department uh, at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. I've been the only uh, non-Latino uh, faculty um, in that department uh, since 2007. <clears throat> My roots extend back 
uh, to Scotland and the English working class, Irish, Finnish, that, that European American mix. Now, I've lived in Haiti. I've, I've lived in Brazil. I was a professor in 2005 in Managua y Leon in, in Nicaragua. I lived in the Dominican Republic, spent a lot of time in, 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 in Venezuela. So I do have the lived um, experiences, which I, which I think is important to bring to the students. Uh, I've had something like 6,500 uh, students because I checked in with uh, all of my students during the um, pandemic because I had a email list from each class extending back to uh, 2006 and um, overwhelmingly black and, and, and Latino students. So I always found uh, different ways to draw these international uh, uh, connections. And, and I think we always have to go back to uh, the German pastor Martin Neumuller's uh, quote, which I think we all know almost by heart by now, or can at least paraphrase. First, they came for the socialists, but I wasn't a socialist, so I stayed quiet. And then they came for the LGBTQ plus uh, uh, individuals, and you know I'm adapting it to, to, to present day. And then they came for the Jewish people, and I stayed silent because I wasn't Jewish. And then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak up on um, my behalf. I think that's an important uh, quote and formulation to keep coming back from because in my department, um, there hasn't been support. I think there is uh, confusion. I think there is uh, silence um, be because of the uh, intimidation. I have not, you know, my, my phone is blown up, but the support has not come from, uh, uh, from within the department. Uh, it's come from, you know, this is how Lisa and I met. We had worked in uh, CUNY for Palestine together and then, um, because we've been through such, you know, of course, there's differences, but um, similar uh, circumstances, punished because of our um, willingness to use our own personal social media platforms to advocate for what we consider to be peace and justice, you know, quote unquote, the American way, but this exposes the uh, hypocrisy to quote, Dr. Mark Lamont Hill and the founder of Jewish Voice for Peace, progressive, progressive, except for Palestine. And the way they've tried to make the question of Palestine uh, so quote unquote controversial and you just don't get it. This is not colonial. This is just, it's just so complicated. No, there's nothing complicated about what the pilgrims did and there's nothing complicated about what uh, General Custer did and Andrew Jackson in the Trail of Tears. And we actually have holidays to remember uh, the true history of Native Americans. But in fact, most of the holidays, uh, Thanksgiving and, and, and Columbus Day, who do these holidays truly uh, honor? And of course, to us, Columbus Day, we would never celebrate the uh, first tourist and the first rapist and in that horrific colonial legacy. It's Indigenous Peoples Day uh, of, of resistance. So. When Miriam was speaking again, I identified because on October 9th, 10th, I used the department listserv uh, eh, relating to all of my coworkers, who most of whom have known me for two decades. And I said, what's playing out in Palestine, in Gaza, in the West Bank, in occupied Palestine is an anti-colonial struggle. This is Tupac Amaru and the Incas resisting Spanish colonialism. This is Emiliano Zapata in Pancho Villa. You know, this is this is the Mexican saying they have a right to overcome the 1848 U.S. war of aggression against Mexico. So I put it in those anti-colonial terms. And um, yeah, I was um, I was chastised. I was, um, you know, I got a little slap on the wrist. I was told absolutely uh, not to do that. And I, you know, shame on me, because am I that naive, you know, 20 years into this journey? I, I still thought that my colleagues, people I've known for so long, would care about human life in Palestine and the indigenous, and it, it hurt, you know, it really, really hurt. Um, that Zionism 101, to isolate Gaza, to isolate us from standing with Gaza. Um, what electricity is there in Gaza? What internet is there in Gaza? How many 
at this point, I think it's 145 journalists who've been murdered in cold blood in Gaza. We've never seen, I mean, Lisa was providing all the numbers earlier. Uh, all of the measures of genocide are there. Um, how many aid workers have been killed and the hypocrisy of the West to say, oh, those seven aid workers, it's just so appalling what happened. But if we were looking at a serious demographic study, that a serious death toll with all of the children who are now malnourished and dehydrated in the suffocation campaign and no journalist can get in and they halt all of the, the, the aid and they use hunger as a weapon, I mean, that death toll has to be uh, far in excess. And what about the trauma? Is there one home still, this is, this is a real question, is there one home still standing in, in Gaza? Of any of those 2.3 million Palestinian children, families, mothers, grandmothers, cousins, uh, compadres, and, 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 and neighbors, who's not traumatized? And medical experts and have been saying now for decades that in Palestine, one cannot talk about post-traumatic stress disorder because the Palestinian people are born into trauma, colonial trauma, historic trauma, generational trauma. So even if, you know, Biden and Blinken and Lloyd Austin as if they cared with their forked tongue saying one thing to the U.S. people as they continue to send billions and billions of dollars, the access of genocide, uh, they've long used Israel as a battling ram against Syria, against Iran, against Lebanon. So the implications go way beyond uh, uh, with the axis of genocide and their, their attacks. It goes way beyond Palestine. So, yeah, f f for me, you know, my department, you know, um, 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 I hope, I mean, I hope, I, one would hope, one can never lose hope that others would feel solidarity in compassion, you know, I received this or that DM, private message, you know, I stand with you. I guess people are, um, are, are intimidated. I can't relate on a human level because, um, you know, just the way my mother uh, raised me, I'm just the type of individual, if, if Bossom's getting bullied right now, I'm, I'm headed south because Bossom doesn't, he's, he's a man of peace and he does good work. So if he's getting bullied, that's an offense to all of us, I've tried to live by those uh, uh, principles. And, you know, I, I hope my um, co-workers can, can use their voices and, and, and can draw these uh, connections. But it's, it's really also, too, it's just the miseducation of uh, the American people. Where would we ever learn about Palestine? Um, it might be a newsflash for some, but the Palestinians don't own Fox News or MSNBC or Facebook or Twitter that's owned by Zionists and capitalists who 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 walk in lockstep to the tune of Palestinian death as they have been for 76 years. So everyone, you know, go out and, and, and buy yourself a book and, and read it like yesterday, because time is of essence um, to halt this genocide is, is not going to be easy. Shout out to South Africa and Nicaragua and Ireland and the global south. And yes, I included Ireland in the global south. 880 years of, of British colonialism against the Irish, against, you know, part of part of my my roots. And that's why Ireland has stood up. The, the Irish know that they have a historic uh, uh, connection to the Palestinian struggle. Um, thank you. Before we go on, I'd like to just uh, share <clears throat> what we have done so far, because we're going to continue to speak with people who have been targeted. Um, let me see. Uh, just one second. Hmm. There we go. So we have so far spoken with uh, uh, of Younes <clears throat> um, and Maura Finkelstein, and today we're speaking with uh, Danny Shaw and Lisa Hoffman Kuroda. We are planning on uh, continuing the series and speaking with people who are being targeted, and we have it right there on the announcement that we are focusing uh, primarily, uh, at least at the outset, 
on the most vulnerable folks who um, are uh, not in uh, tenure track jobs, even though those people have been targeted as well. And we will also be speaking to various interlocutors, uh, legal um, advocates, and uh, other folks who will be sharing the broad institutional and legal context within which this is taking place. Because as I understand it, based on my very close, uh, 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 I guess, uh, attention to this particular uh, area, uh, the forces, quote unquote, that are being amassed right now uh, uh, against people speaking out on the question of Palestine are becoming more and more systematic uh, to try to intimidate, smear, and so on. And as I said earlier, the really encouraging and inspiring development is that uh, there's so much happening on uh, the the side of uh, fighting for academic freedom. And because the pendulum has been swinging against uh, what Israel is committing in terms of horrors and um, slaughter and genocide, there there is a tide right now that is supportive of those fighting for academic freedom, even in defense of uh, Palestine, which is something that we haven't seen in this country, in the United States for, I mean, forever, actually. So uh, we would like to ask folks who are interested in uh, either joining this effort or supporting what uh, we are doing to feel free to send uh, any kinds of uh, uh, material stories uh, to uh, SC, that's S as in Sam, C as in Carol, at palestineandcontext.org where you will also find all of the previous uh, teach-ins that the Gaza and Context project has produced, even though this project is, this particular project is co-sponsored and co-organized by a number of other organizations, but you can go to uh, Palestine, palestineandcontext.org and watch all the previous um, um, teach-ins and uh, webinars, podcasts, lectures, what have you. Um, I would like to ask a question to both Danny and Lisa, something that I, I mentioned a little while ago, and then we will try to release you as we approach 90 minutes, because I know you you, you all have a life. Um, so the question is, it's a, it's, it's a, it could be viewed as a rhetorical question. What do you think Israel supporters, whether in government or in our, on our campuses, why are they so scared, so scared and terrified of people just recounting history or their version of history? Let's even assume that, you know, there is no oppressor and oppressed in the world. There's no rich and poor, there's no powerful and, you know, weak uh, state or what have you, a weaker state. What, 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 what is it that, why do you think Israel supporters are so scared and terrified? of people just speaking out, even saying uh, free Palestine, which um, which people sometimes feel offended by. And as some, even on the chat, you know, we're saying you know, people feel unsafe when they hear something like that. So that, that it's just a bro open question. And I'd love to hear what you have to say, both Danny and Lisa. And Mariam, you as well, because I know you also had your own share of, um, uh, of, of issues. Uh, in terms of uh, targeting. Do you want to go first, Danny, or should I? You okay. kick it off, kick it off. <laughs> well, I don't know. I didn't grow up in a household with the Zionist ideology, so I can't claim to speak in the mind of someone who, who did grow up with that. But, um, I guess, first of all, I would say it has to do with the psychology of the oppressor and the oppressed, right? Um, because we see this play out with the history of the United States in terms of white people and black people, right? Like, I mean, there's this, this, this idea that, that um, of, of white fragility, that there's, you know, white people characterizing, you know, black people as scary or as predators when 
In fact, white people have, have been the ones that have oppressed black people for hundreds of years. But there's this way that the oppressed are framed as threatening and scary and that whites are the ones that need to be protected from that when it's really the reverse, right? Um, and that goes for any situation like that. Um, and, and the programming is so so deep, you know, um, the psychological programming. I mean, this is true in Japan as well, um, you know, where Japanese people still view Koreans as threatening or scary or as criminals, right? There's this just deep ingrained, I mean, it's it's prejudice, but it's also this weird twisted sense of fear that the, the oppressor is actually the, the oppressed, right? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a weird psychological contradiction. Um, but I guess the other thing that I would say is like in terms of campuses and like campus culture, like I don't, I don't know that they're scared actually. Like the student in my class who went out of her way to track down my social media, look through all my posts, and then show it to my my department or my my program head like i don't think she was scared you know i think she did that because she knew that she had the whole power structure behind her right and that even if none of the other students in my class agreed with her her one little voice would be enough to get me fired i think she did that because she knew she could plain and simple so i don't think she was scared at all um, and they, and they do this because they, f they feel emboldened. They, they, they have something behind them. You know, they have some kind of power structure behind them that supports them. Um, so, so I, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I don't think that they're actually scared, but they might frame it that way, right. To, to, mm -hmm. to frame themselves as the victim, right. When we know that they're not, um, they use these terms safety, right safety comes up over and over and over again someone feels unsafe you know i mean this is this is this is something that white people do as well you know they feel unsafe when someone threatens their worldview i mean whether or not that's related to actual material safety is immaterial right i mean they they it's their it's their psychology that feels threatened so then they can claim that their physical safety has been threatened when nothing has been threatened at all you know, meanwhile, um, you know, the Center for Islamic Life at Rutgers University just yesterday was vandalized. The windows were smashed. It was broken into. I mean, what's that? That's not that's not an assault on physical safety. That's not Muslim students feeling unsafe. You know, where is the where is the concern for their safety? The Columbia Palestinian students were attacked with chemical weapons that the IDF uses in Palestine, the same chemical weapons, and no concern was given to their safety. I mean, those students had those chemicals on them for weeks. Their eyes were burning, stinging. It ruined all of their clothing. They were traumatized, but their safety was not taken into consideration. Anyway, so, you know, my opinion is that they're not actually scared at all, but they use the language of fear and the language on unsafety to create a narrative of sympathy for them. And we see many other groups Colonial, colonially dominant groups do the same thing, right? Um, so that's just my opinion. But quickly, you know, I, I appreciate this. I mean, it was kind of like a trick question, but quickly, uh, do you think this is, before we go to Danny, do you think this is, uh, and hopefully Danny can also answer the second uh, quick follow up, do you think this is a, uh, um, a, a sort of um, offense, people taking offense at the proliferation of pushback against privilege? I mean, this is a privilege that when you say that one, one student can with one communication get a human being who has worked all their lives on various topics, including human rights, can get them fired. This is, this is privilege. So is it, is it the, the, the in, people feeling indignant about uh, pushback against privilege maybe? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I imagine so. I, I imagine if you've, um, I don't know, but I imagine if you've grown up your entire life thinking that um, your group is the victim, um, that everyone is out to get you, 
that any kind of narrative that challenges the one that you grew up with is a is is a hateful, right? Um, I imagine that it's easy to to spin it that way. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, Danny, what's your take? Are they scared or are they feigning okay. fear or are they offended that their that their privilege of having the powers that be on their side being challenged? I think the Zionist is the most uh, insecure uh, social creature in the sense that uh, it's, you know, who's going to write the book, The Miseducation of the Zionist, because you're now talking about three, four generations of Zionists, of Israelis, who, as, as we have this productive conversation, and this is based on history, and this is factual, and we've garnered the books and the evidence and the primary sources, and Al-Nakba, the catastrophe, 500 Palestinian villages are wiped out in, in 1948 to pave the way for this Zionist entity, this massive Western U.S. battling ram in the Middle East, basically a massive U.S. military base parked smack dab in the middle of historic Kurdish and Arab and uh, Persian and you know all this land it's, it's it's so strategic and they have duped they have bamboozled <clears throat> these individuals going back with this claim of 2000 years ago there was continuity this is our land and but then the Zionist looks in the mirror uh, trying to convince themselves that hey I'm indigenous baby and the Zionist says well wait a minute I don't I don't look like Bassam I don't look like Miriam. I do look a little bit like, you know, Danny Shaw. So there's something, something does it. I mean, it's just, it's just, it, it, it's so common sense. And the hypocrisy of uh, so many of these liberals out here back in October, November, six months of genocide, they're afraid to ask questions or say anything at work or at a family function. I mean, God forbid I offend a Jewish uh, coworker. Um, you know, if the truth is uh, offensive, people need to uh, really dig up the, the, the truth of history. This is 76 years of uh, gaslighting. Part of this miseducation, what they've uh, done, they've tried to conflate the history of Morocco or Iraq or the Middle East with the history of Europe. It's European civilization that fails the Jewish people. It is German industrialism and in and, and French monarchy and in British colonialism. It's the colonial boomerang of violence that swings back around and consumes 27 million Soviet lives, 6 million socialist, feminist, Roma people, the elderly, Poles, etc., and 6 million Jews. Interesting, the way we're taught it, in, in, in the US, no one's ever gonna tell you about the Russian or the Ukrainian or the Georgian lives because that's not convenient for the powers that be. And that's why we study Dr. Norman Finkelstein who talks about, he's one of the great scholars on this topic and he talks about the misuse and the weaponization of anti-Semitism so they can shut uh, the bold uh, voices up. They can gaslight us. And, and, and say that they're the victims. Everyone remembers Black Lives Matter. There was a, a slogan in t-shirts that many of us wore that black lives were worth more than quote unquote white feelings. And that's what uh, Lisa and I got caught up in. We got caught up in uh, hurt feelings because the Zionists can't accept for a second that they, you know, since they're the, 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 the big victim, right? The big victim who receives $14 billion back in October from genocide Joe Biden. Um, who receive on average $4 billion per year of our taxpayer money, but they're the victims, right? What do the Palestinians uh, 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 receive? This is David versus genocidal Goliath. And, and, you know, shame on anyone out there who's been quiet. What are you waiting for? And it's that neutrality, it's that silence that isolates the Leases and the Dannys and the Morris and the High Rose and the Amins. There was a professor at uh, NYU, Amin, who went through something very similar. Uh, I've worked with the National Writers Union. There's many different journalists and teachers who are in a similar boat, forced into retirement, suspended, fired, on leave, under investigation. And hopefully by us uh, raising our voices, um, we can begin to inspire them to come out of the shadows because 
And Attack on One, this is really our slogan in CUNY for Palestine, and Attack on One is an attack on all. And, and, and shout out to CUNY for Palestine. No one had to come to John Jay yesterday. They could have went, watched a movie, drank a Corona, and hung out and said, woof, glad it wasn't me. My name ain't Lisa. But you know how many dozens and dozens of people showed up? And they did it intentionally on one of the most important Muslim holidays. And none of the Muslim students could really even be there. Some made an incredible effort to still make it. So it's, it's really sinister. Uh, imagine. I mean, that would be front page of the Daily News in the New York Post. And yeah, Zionism and their colonial overlords, the Trumps, the Bushes, the Obamas, the Clintons, Tweedledee, Tweedledum, they got the New York Post, they got the New York Times, they got the Chicago Tribune, but we got the truth. And when you have the truth, nothing can uh, stop you. So that's why they gaslight. That's why they're so uh, insecure. They try to get to the front of our town halls and cut the line and stuff to tell everybody just how indigenous they are and it really is sad i mean this is what the uh, classic scholars abraham leon out of uh, belgium an incredible uh, jewish scholar who wrote the jewish question this is what they refer to, refer to historically as the zionist death trap because even if hypothetically they continue to pulverize and annihilate palestinian life 76 long genocidal years what about lebanon what about Iraq? What about one, uh, I think it's half a billion. When I say the Arab world, that's not, a, that's not, that's not accurate. There's, there's Kurds and there's, and, and, and there's Berbers, there's all these different nationalities and, and, and languages. But for the sake of simplification, when the Arab world continues to wake up, and shout out to all of our Jordanian sisters and brothers, six million plus of whom have Palestinian roots kicked out of their historic lands, and they're being repressed by the kingdom uh, on, on the border of the West Bank and Gaza there in Jordan. Shout out to our Saudi sisters and brothers oppressed by these 2000 punk princes who have never done, and these, these are cowards, and they have to be called out. What have they done for uh, Palestine? But Israel, with all of its nuclear weapons and all of its nuclear arrogance, oh, they shook. Oh, they scared. I mean, you know, they, they frame it as a demographic population war, and that's the first thing they'll throw at you. Well, how is this a genocide? The Palestinian population has continued to grow through the years. They're extremely, extremely insecure. When your entire history is uh, based off of bull malarkey and lies, wouldn't you be insecure? <laughs> I appreciate that point so much, uh, especially in terms of kind of putting this, um, the language of, of safety in, into context, into some in sharp relief in terms of how it actually operates on campuses, how it's systematically possible for exactly one person to target um, their faculty um, and, and use this very language, which of course was uh, introduced into higher education to actually address uh, anti-racist uh, issues on campus and, and the discrimination of, of, of students on campus. Um, so I think uh, since we've had such an illuminating conversation and I'm very grateful to both of you uh, for sharing about your story and helping us get a better sense of how we can approach this moment um, with, with this kind of clear-eyed, passionate uh, understanding. Um, what advice uh, would you offer to other faculty um, who, are, who are going through this uh, issue right now, who are dealing with targeted uh, attacks on their campus or being intimidated by colleagues? Um, I have a sense that, uh, you know, it might be to stay strong and to be connected to others, but are there particular things that you would like to highlight, um, especially for adjunct faculty? Um, I, I appreciated Lisa's point earlier that when you went in for your meeting, um, you had a union rep with you. Um, so what are some of the, the kind of policy uh, options that are available for people who are who are dealing with this? And more generally, if there's any advice that you would like to offer um, to those who are listening. Yeah, um, thanks, Miriam. I think, I think for adjuncts, um, you know, not not all adjuncts are have a union or have union representation. Um, and even when they do, 
uh, those unions are not always pro-Palestine, you know, uh, the, pa the Palestine exception uh, is, is operative there too. So, you know, unions aren't like a magic fix for, for our problems. Um, and that education has to go on in the unions too. I think that labor unions in this country could be doing so much more, you know, right now. Um, workers could be shutting this country down completely, you know, and the fact that they haven't is, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it, it's a reflective of the, the shortcomings of the labor movement to address Zionism you know, in its ranks and in its leadership. So, um, you know, I, I, I think that it's better than having union representation is better than nothing, but, you know, at least in my case, it was not ultimately helpful, you know? So a union is only as good as the people that make it up. And so you have, they have to, you have to continue agitating and organizing and edu yeah, about Zionism and about Palestine um, in those union spaces too. I think that's really, really important and key. Um, I wish that, I wish that there were more organizations like Pal Legal that had the ability to help us, um, you know, with our legal rights, but unfortunately, you know, there's so many of us that are facing discipline and backlash at our workplaces that organizations like Pal Legal are completely overwhelmed and, you know, are not able to help all of us. So I think that Unfortunately, community support is is all we have. Um, and right now, at least for me, that's all I have. Um, and I wish that all faculty and all students would, I mean, okay, faculty in particular, I, I, I wish that you would all just speak up about this because then the, the, every single faculty that stays silent about the question of Palestine um, maybe, maybe you talk about it privately to your friends, but you're not going to, you're not going to bring it up, uh, publicly. You're not going to, you're not going to push back against it at a meeting, et cetera, et cetera. Every single faculty that remains silent like that and protects their careers over what they know is right, um, means that the rest of us are that much more endangered, you know, um, the more of us speak out, the safer we all are. Um, and again, it's this mentality that's cultivated in academia where everyone's little just out for themselves, you know, everyone's out to protect their little career. And, and if I don't, if I, if I don't anger the, this person or that person, then I'm going to be okay. You know, um, this mentality has got to go, you know, it's like, it's, it's really, it's really sad. And, um, you might think it's going to protect you for a while, but you could be next, you know? So I, I, I really, I really wish that more people would, would speak out, um, and take, like, take, take risk to their careers because, um, you know, at the end of the day, like me losing a few classes as an adjunct is not the same anywhere, the same as what Palestinians are going through, what they're sacrificing. Um, but, um, but here in the United States, like we, to really push the needle, like we have to, we have to be, we have to be willing to take risks to change the status quo. That's just, that's just the bottom line. You know, if you're, if you're trying to like do this in a way that is going to, if you, you think you can do this in a way that is, you don't have to sacrifice anything of your own comforts, of your own privileges, you're probably not threatening the power structure very much, right? Um, so I would just like really encourage people to, to reckon with that. Like, what are, what are your, what are your priorities? How will you live with yourself after this? Um, is, is your career really that, that important that you can live with yourself for staying silent? You know, I, I don't know. I mean, I have to contend with my soul when I die and <laughs> that's what I'm worried about. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would say like, at the end of the day, what we have is community support. And when these kinds of things happen, um, even if we don't end up getting our jobs back, or even if we don't end up getting justice um, through legal means, which you know I have very little faith in, um, it, it, it can politicize people. Um, it can catalyze people. Drawing attention to the case can wake people up. And so I hope, I hope that 
us continuing to be loud about this um, serves that purpose um, and serves for further organizing. Um, but that's all I have. <clears throat> I can uh, jump right in. I mean, just, just hearing Lisa, I think that says it all. And in, in the inspiration, I feel um, not, not to be alone, you know, even in this uh, interview. And more people, I think, are going to uh, come forward uh, because there's been hundreds and hundreds, if not higher numbers of professionals and educators and teachers and journalists who are in, in enduring this. Uh, I had a, a student out in um, San Diego. She was uh, fired because she had a water bottle that said Free Palestine, and that set something in motion where two years later she was fired. I mean, it gets just more and more preposterous, but and they can try to intimidate us. They can't intimidate us all. They can try to fire us. They can't fire us all. You know, as the Haitian people teach us, when you have a lot of hands, the, the burden, the historic stand up for um, one another, because what they're trying to do, too, is uh, blacklist us, make sure that we can't get hired, you know, here, here or there reminiscent of McCarthyism in the 1950s, a very uh, dark chapter in the history of this country to blacklist the Paul Robesons and a huge chunk of, of, of Hollywood and how many other um, nameless uh, victims of this repression. Why? Because we've stood up against the genocide. Um, but where there is repression, there is resistance. And the different departments uh, at John Jay, who are not even my department, they, you know, they've taken me out to eat and they've, they've, they've stood with me and they've just showed me that love. Because when you get fired, it's intimidating, it's, it's isolating. Like I was getting excited about different award ceremonies at the end of the year. And I had just rece received a prestigious uh, teaching award in December. I mean, I knew it meant nothing when I got it, but just how, how, empty how vacuous that you you give a professor an award after some 20 years and then oh by the way you fired i mean you know malcolm x taught us uh, show us the democracy there is no democracy this is pure hypocrisy um but the solidarity that we feel from others from palestine legal uh from um different uh, uh lawyers there's the parachute uh project or mission my, my apologies if i pronounced it uh, uh, wrong. Um, our union, the professional staff, Congress, there's a lot of people who've contacted me working from uh, within, but there's a huge contradiction between the everyday rank and file. I think there's something like uh, 20,000 of us in the PSC, but the leadership has done everything to try to placate us and say, well, we're on the side of uh, justice, but what have they actually done? Six months into the genocide, if the PSC hasn't made a statement that's embarrassing, that is shameful, the world should know that they then, uh, CUNY and CUNY's leadership then stands with the genocide of an indigenous uh, 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 people, the more of us who uh, speak up, the less intimidated others will be. This is why they're going after TikTok. Young people on TikTok overwhelmingly will not vote for Biden. Uh, young, talk, young people across this country stand with Palestine. And again, that's why they're shook. That's why they take such desperate measures to uh, shut us up. But anyone out there who this can reach, if you have any doubts, hit up all of the organizations that we've mentioned. Uh, every day, Jewish Voice for Peace has 3 p.m. Uh, calls because all of us are so enraged in, in the insomnia and in, in the tragedy. You know, this, this altered our lives. And how do we support one another? How do we fight back against the isolation? And for all of our Palestinian sisters and brothers, we, we can't imagine the trauma that you've been through. And it almost, it, it sounds so liberal, it sounds so white for someone like me to be like, well, how, how do they sleep? How do they take care of themselves? Because the demonstrations, the civil disobedience, I mean, it's a, it's a national liberation struggle and it's now international because so much of the Palestinian diaspora is, is in exile right? In Jordan and in Lebanon and in Paris and in Germany. I've, I've had friends in Germany who were fired or kicked out of school just because they were to, wore a kafia. I mean, Germany, how ashamed must you be of yourself? Speaking of historical denial, 
Germany is trapped between an extermination campaign in Namibia at the turn of the century. Of course, we know about the Holocaust, 27 million Soviets, 6 million of our Jewish sisters and brothers, 6 million others exterminated. And now Germany is the second largest arms supplier to Israel. So again, Germany, France, England, all of them rushing to get on their knees, to genuflect at the altar of death, genocide, and Zionism. It makes me sick. My only regret is that um, you know we can't yell louder and reach more people and, and, and wake up the sleeping giant that is humanity. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I, I don't know what to say. Um, we kind of lied to you because we're almost at two hours. So apologies for that. But there's there's been a lot to discuss. Thank you for your generosity in being with us um, without complaining at all. Thanks, of course, to my uh, co-moderator, Mariam, um, who uh, has been uh, diligently working along with uh, our team to make this happen. And thanks to everybody who's behind the scenes, who is actually doing so much work to Put all of this together uh, I send them a huge shout out these are the people that make the world go round and they never get the right credit they're not interfacing so thanks to all um, we will have uh, their names and uh, I actually conducted interviews with a lot of them uh, that we will post on palestineincontext.org uh, this, again, is a broad collaborative project, uh, thanks to all of the co-organizers and co-sponsors. And most importantly, thanks to you, uh, Lisa Hoffman, Kuroda, and uh, Danny Shaw, for having the courage um, to just keep going, despite what you have endured. Uh, I am sure you know that there are not thousands, but hundreds of thousands and probably millions of people who support uh, your cause and what you're doing and um, for it's for certain that uh, things will not continue to be the way they were. I have to say that in the 1990s and early 2000s, based on any analytical, you know, judgment, I couldn't have said that. But I can say this now. I could be wrong, but I can say this now comfortably that Things will not be the way they were. We do not think, or many of us do not think, that um, uh, Israel can come back from this, or even the United States government, to be quite frank. Um, and the tide is moving in this direction, but it's not in the opposite direction, but it's not automatic. So we have a lot of work to do. And uh, as we have seen from your discourse and your statements, your utmost respect for every single group of human beings is a testament to how problematic and frankly repulsive it is to have actually singled you out for these um, horrible smearing campaigns. So we apologize for that and we are uh, behind you and supportive of you. We will not come on this show or on this podcast, whatever you want to call it, and defend anybody who has actually engaged in what you are being accused of. We will not, we'll just we won't do that because this is why we're here. We're standing for something that is a principle. And we wouldn't have been here unless it was evident that all these uh, accusations were um, fabricated, they're lies. They don't reflect what you actually have been writing and, and we, we, we follow you. So we will keep doing this work and I would love to continue to be in touch with all of you. You will be with us, I'm hoping, in the coming uh, conversations. And um, thanks to uh, the viewers. We actually didn't have, um, we, have we have a lot of comments. We didn't have a lot of questions. We tried to sort of weave in some of the comments into some of the questions. So thanks to all. We will be uh, back soon with another installment. Uh, Danny and Lisa, uh, if you have any last words, let us know. Otherwise, we're going to let you go on with your day. Thank you so much to both of you for inviting us. Um, it's so, so crucial for people like you to give us a platform to speak when these kinds of things happen. Because, you know, if we get fired and then, 
you know, we don't have any chance to tell our side of the story. That's it. You know, they, uh, that's it. We're, we're done. <laughs> there's no, there's nothing happening there. Um, but, but yeah, it's thing. It's thanks to people like you who are willing to give us a platform, willing to give us um, a chance to tell our side of the story um, that then, you know, allows this moment to be a politicizing moment um, for others and um, to connect what is happening to us to other struggles. So I'm really, really grateful to both of you for, for having us and, um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to to following the series and to seeing who else um, you invite on here. Ahlan wa sahlan. Yes, thank you um, to In Defense of Academic Freedom. Thank you to Gaza. Thank you to Occupied Palestine. Thank you to our people right now living that colonial nightmare in the West Bank. You inspire us. It's your resistance. It's your slingshots. It's, it's the David of uh, yesteryear that that keeps fighting this genocidal Goliath. You taught us uh, what it means to be uh, fearless. And everybody, you know, keep studying Palestinian history, keep it alive. Because when you organize a, a history class on Palestine, you refute the Zionist lies. You keep the spirit of Leila Khaled and George Habash and so many of our heroes alive. Keep mobilizing more civil disobedience, shut it down, more marching, more unity. How can we get all these different groups set aside like george jackson taught us every quarrel every personal cheese make gossip he said she said there's one enemy there's one genocide if they can be united in genocide we can be united in peace and life all power to the people thank you uh, but but let's make sure we don't make anyone feel uh, uncomfortable because it's really important for people i'm joking okay thank you all so much uh, thanks, Danny. Thanks, Lisa. You got me, thanks, there, Danny. You got me. I, Where's he going with that? You got me. I got you. I got you, baby. <laughs> you got that uh, poker my, I ain't playing poker with you. Or you down there? I'm now gonna be canceled for calling you, baby. I, I take it back. All right. Thank you all. And it's been two hours. I'm on medications. I think I can be forgiven. Yalla. Salam alaikum. Bonsoir.